On October 20, 1962, the White House Press Corps is told that President John F. Kennedy has a cold. In reality, he is holding secret meetings with advisors on the eve of ordering a blockade of Cuba. Hello, today is October 20th, 2023, and I would like to bring you this day in history. Kennedy was scheduled to attend a Seattle Century 21 World's Fair when his press secretary announced that he had contracted an upper respiratory infection. The president then flew back to Washington where he, sus where he supposedly went to bed to recover from his cold. Four days earlier, Kennedy had seen photographic proof that the Soviets were building 40 ballistic missile sites on the island of Cuba within striking distance of the United States. Kennedy's supposed bed rest was actually a marathon secret sessions with advisors to decide upon a response to the Soviet action. The group believed that Kennedy had three choices, to negotiate with the Russians to remove the missiles, to bomb the missile sites in Cuba, or to implement a naval blockade of the island. Kennedy chose to blockade Cuba, deciding to bomb the missile sites only if further action proved necessary. The blockade began on October 21st, and the next day Kennedy discovered a public address alert. Kennedy delivered a public address alert alerting Americans on the situation and calling on the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev to remove the missiles or face retaliation by the United States. Kerchev responded by sending more ships, possibly carrying military cargo, toward Cuba and allowing construction at the site to continue. Over the following six days, the Cuban Missile Crisis, as it is now known, brought the world to brink of global nuclear war while two leaders engaged in tense negotiation via telegraph and letter. By October 28th, Kennedy and Kerchev had reached a settlement and the people on both sides of the conflict breathed a collective by weary sigh of relief. But weary sigh of relief. The Cuban missile sites were dismantled and in return, Kennedy agreed to close the U.S. missile sites in Turkey. Now I'd like to bring you another This Day in History. On October 20th, 1968, 21-year-old Oregon, Oregon, Oregonian Dick Forsby wins gold and sets an Olympic record when he high jumps seven feet four and a quarter inches at the New Mexico City Games. It was the first American victory in the event since 1956. It was also the international debut of For Forsberry's unique jumping style known as the Forsberry flop. The flop, according to one journalist, looked like a guy falling off the back of a truck instead of the traditional scissors or saddle style forward kick over the bar. It featured the Midar rotation so that the jumper landed back of the head first on the mat. Forsby described it this way, I take off on my right or outside foot rather than my left foot, then turn my back to the bar, arch my back over the bar, and then kick my legs out to clear the bar. It looked odd, but it worked better than any other technique. Forsby had invented his flop in high school when he discovered that 
though he was terrible at the scissor kick, the saddle, and the belly roll, if he stretched out on his back and landed head first, he could jump higher than anyone on his high school track team. The adventure, he said, from the physics standpoint is, it allows the jumper to run at the bar with more speed and with the arch in your back, you could actually clear the bar and keep your center of gravity at or below the bar, so it was much more effective. The Oregon State Univer at Oregon State University, he used the flop to win the 1968 NCAA title and the Olympic trials. I think quite a few kids will begin trying it my way now, he said when the games were over. I don't guarantee my results but I don't recommend my style to anyone. All I say is if a kid can't saddle, straddle, he can try it my way. And indeed kids everywhere began to practice the flop over the backs of their sofas and into piles of leaves in yards. Parents and coaches worried that Forsby technique was dangerous. The U.S. Olympic coach Pat Jordan even warned that it would wipe out the entire generation of high jumpers because they would all have broken necks. But the flop soon became standard practice at track meets. With a decade, almost every elite high jumper was doing it Forsberry's way. Now I'd like to bring you yet another This Day in History. In the summer of 1977, members of the rock band Aerosmith inspected a, an airplane they were considering charting for their upcoming tour. A Convair 240 operated out of Addison, Texas. Concerns over the flight crew led Aerosmith to look elsewhere, a decision that saved one band but doomed another. The aircraft in question was instead chartered by the band Leonard Skinner, who were just setting out that autumn on a national tour that promised to be their biggest to date. On October 20th, 1977, however, during a flight from Greenville, Greenville, South Carolina to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Leonard's tour plane crashed in a heavy, heavily wooded area of southwestern Mississippi during a failed emergency landing attempt, killing band members Ronnie Van Sant, Steve Gaines, Casey Gaines, as well as the band's assistant road manager and the plane's pilot and co-pilot. 20 others survived the crash. The original core of Leonard Skinner, Ronnie Van Sants, Bill Burns, Gary Rossin, Rossington, Alan Collins, and Larry Jude Storm first came together under the name My Backyard back in 1964 at Jackson as Jacksonville, Florida teenagers. Under that name and several other group developments, it chopped playing local and regional gigs throughout the 1960s and early 70s, then finally broke out nationally in 1973 following the adoption of the name Leonard Skinner in honor of a high school gym teacher's nemesis name Leonard Skinner, S-K-I-N-N-E-R. The newly renamed band scored a major hit with their hard-driving debut album pronounced Leonard Skinner, 1973, which featured one of the most familiar and jokes about rock anthems of all time, Freebird. Their follow-up album, Second Helping, 1974, 
included even bigger hit Sweet Home Alabama and it secured the band's status as giants of the Southern Rock subgenre. On October 17, 1977, Leonard Skinner released their fifth studio album, Street Survivors, which would eventually be certified double platinum. Three days later, however, tragedy struck the group when their chartered Covert 240 began to run out of fuel at 6,000 feet en route to Baton Rouge. The plane's crew, who the National Transportation Safety Board would hold responsible for the mishap in the accident report issued eight months later, radioed Houston air traffic control as the plane lost altitude, asking for directions to the nearest air force. Airfield, we're low on fuel and we're just about out of it. The pilot told Houston Center approximately 6 42 p.m. We went vector to Macomb Airfield post haste. Please, sir. Approximately 13 minutes later, however, the plane crashed outside of Gillsburg, Gils Mississippi. I want to thank you for watching today. And as always, stay safe and stay blessed. And remember to smile because I love you. But more importantly, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ loves you too. And that's the best love that you could have. And would you um, think about subscribing? If you haven't subscribed, if you're new here, welcome. Um, come over and join our Serendipity Subby family. Subscribing doesn't cost a thing. It's free. Um, when you do subscribe, please press that all notification bell button so you get upload so you'll get notified every time I upload a new video. And please comment below. See, um, let me know what you think about these history videos. Am I doing good? Did, would you want something else? Um, I love history. It's my passion, and I love doing these videos every day. Um, please give me a thumbs up if you like this video. And we will see you, I will see you in my next video. Bye everybody, have a blessed day.